Requesting connection. Established. Encrypted. We're live. The show you've been asking for. Advice, technology, and community. Linux first, all others second. This is Ask Noah. Live, multi-speed technology is the Ask Noah show starts right now. This is the show where we came to do all the things on Linux they said couldn't be done and take your questions on how to do the same. The phone lines are open this hour to be a part of the program. It is a free call, 1-855-450-NOAH. That's 1-855-450-6624 or send an email to live at asknoahshow.com. My name is Noah Chalai. I am your host. Delighted to be here with you as another episode of the Ask Noah Show kicks off this hour. Joining me yet again, Steve Ovens. Steve, welcome back, sir. Hey, Noah. Good to be back on a regular basis with you. Yeah, yeah. I'm really enjoying it. And we're going to get to a piece of feedback that addresses that as well. Our first piece of feedback comes in from Charlie Brown. Charlie says, good day, Linux and FOSS community. I'm looking for a VPS provider that accepts payment with physical cash and anonymous accounts. This will include... Uh, Services outside the Five Eyes Surveillance Nation, in other words, the U.S., U.K., Canada, New Zealand, and Australia, the Nine Eyes, and he lists a whole other bunch of countries, the 14 Eyes, and then all those countries plus a bunch more. Thanks in advance. Um, So I don't mean to be the bearer of bad news here, but uh, that could be a real difficult feat, right? Can you imagine having a server hosting company inside of the data center? Yeah, hey, Bill. We need to uh, go ahead and collect this month's payment. All right. Well, uh, line the folks up outside the front door with their cash, and then um, we'll take them over to the cash register there and check them out and bill them for the month. Like, I don't know how that would work, right? I, You might, and I emphasize the, the phrase might, be able to find a VPS provider that accepts anonymous currency like Bitcoin or something like that. But even in that case, you know, they, they're they up against a tremendous amount of liability because for the most part, and not that there aren't exceptions to this and not that this should be the standard that we should use. And I'm so I want to be clear about that. The vast majority of people that would go looking for a VPS provider that accepts anonymous payment would want to do something bad with that, uh, with that provider. Now, now, again, I want to be clear. That's not necessarily the only people that would do that. Plenty of legitimate uses to include just having a private connection to, uh, to to a server. But I'm just telling you that the amount of traffic that would come from that data center that would be malicious would so overwhelm the operations department that that's all they would do. And if you add the hassle of having to collect payment on top of that in any sort of physical medium... Uh, the, the business model just isn't, I mean, I don't see the business model. Steve, do you have any idea of anybody that would offer something like this? Closest I can think of was, um, I know that there are a few that do accept digital currencies like um, Bitcoin and Ethereum, but I, like you said, usually even then there is some sort of account or something that's tied to it. Um, I know that there are VPN services that do something similar, but they're on a completely different level of exposure, like you were talking about, as opposed to a VPS where someone can launch attacks from that. Um, yeah, I'm. The only thing I can think of is, you know, as an alternative, is maybe looking into something with Tor, like getting getting um, some sort of server onto Tor and being on the quote unquote dark web. I think is the closest that you may get to this, but. I have no idea. Yeah, and even in that case, um, <clears throat> what's the guy's name? Uh, Ross Albrecht rented a server and ran it on Tor to run the Silk Road. And in his case, what happened was once they tra- once Tor leaked the IP address, supposedly, uh, the the government went to the VPS provider and said, "We want a copy of that server," and they just gave them a copy of the hard drive. Uh, so you know, again. If you're looking for the kind of protection that I assume you're looking for, you really need to have that hardware in your own hands and under your own control. Likely that includes the internet. And I just, you're not going to get an IP address assigned to you without having some sort of identifiable information attached to it. Unless you're going through a company who is expressly set up to do something anonymously. So like one of the things that I thought is the prepaid credit card is a great idea, Steve. I think another way that you might be able to do that is, you know, you could sign up for something like a uh, private internet access account through a VPN 
then host your internet server and then VPN in from your from your hosted server through your VPS, which would obscure your traffic, uh, which doesn't completely get you there because again, if it ever leaks or if anybody ever suspects or wants to go through, um, you know, your VPS provider, I think your host. So I, I, I suspect you're looking for a unicorn, but should you find one or if anybody else out there knows, like I said, there are plenty of legitimate uses uh, for this use case. So I, I'd be interested in knowing as well. Our second email comes in from Chris. Chris is responding to a feedback segment from last week. We were talking about, or excuse me, our pick of the week last week, where we were talking about Ventoy. Chris Reich sends us, Hi Noah, caught the latest episode of the Ask Noah show from afar. I now live in Japan. I used to catch you live, but with the time difference, that makes things a bit uh, challenging. In the episode, you discussed Ventoy, and there was a bit of a sidebar on the device that Chris Fisher was using. Like Chris, I used to have one of those external hard drive types that were featured an LCD display and a toggle switch in the onboard firmware that allowed you to select an ISO and then boot a device from it. This device, to this day, still has one major advantage. It emulates a CD-ROM. This can be particularly useful for older devices that have BIOS limitations that prevent them from booting from USB flash drives. But I digress. I, too, was using flash drives for a long time until, like Chris, I switched to an external enclosure for an M.2 NVMe enclosure. I inser inserted a 512 gigabyte M.2 NVMe drive onto the enclosure and loaded it up with Ventoy and my ISO library. And never, I've not since looked back. This is one device that I carry with me everywhere. It features a USB 3.1, both USB-C and standard USB 3.1 connector. It's blazing fast, and the entire device is in a heatsink, so no heating issues that I'm aware of, although it does get a little warm to the touch at times. I've attached some pictures. It's made by Inno, and the model is the 2597. Thanks for the awesome show and all you do for the Linux community. Domo, <laughs> Domo arigato gozaimasu. Uh, best regards, Chris. Uh, so thanks, Chris, for writing in. Thanks also for the Japanese. It's funny. Steve, have you, you've you traveled abroad, yeah? Yep. So I, I the first time I went to Japan, I it was great because I stayed inside of Tokyo. And inside Tokyo, most of the people speak English. So it works out fine and, and it's okay. Second time I went, I, I, I was, I was, I, I told myself, I was like, well, I want to learn a little bit of Japanese. Now, the nice thing was, the first time, even though everybody did speak English, it was, it was kind of a fun novelty to like, oh, I figure out that every time I hold the door open for somebody, they go, oh, I got the gozaimasu. And I'm like, oh, that must mean thank you. You know, you kind of figure some of those things out. And as uh, so the second time I went back, I paid a lot more attention uh, to the language. And I, 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 I learned a couple of basic phrases. So at least I could point and say things like please and thank you. And I made it an effort to only speak Japanese while I was in Japan. And I found that to be a, a super fun thing. If you've ever heard anybody tell you the fastest way to learn a language is to be around other people that speak it, it is 110% true. I learned more Japanese in a week and a half or 10 days or whatever it was. Uh, the second time I was in Japan, and then I think I learned in the six months leading up to the trip where I was trying to teach myself Japan, just living there and being there and being in a restaurant and like, well, you're not going to eat. This one was the second time I traveled outside Tokyo and uh, and got to a place where literally nobody spoke English. It was kind of fun. Um, so, yeah, uh, I thanks for writing in, Chris, and thanks for catching us on the backside. I hope you're enjoying Japan. It's one of my favorite places I've ever visited. We'll have the link for this enclosure uh, included in the show notes, which you can find at podcast.asknoahshow.com. Uh, dot com. I tell you what, here's what we're going to do. I, uh, I I decided this uh, just now. I decided we're going to do this. Uh, we're going to give uh, one of these, uh, we're going to give an enclosure with an M.2 uh, drive away. I, I think that's something we have to do because this is this has come up a couple of times and uh, there's somebody out there that needs one. There's somebody out there that needs an ISO library with Ventoy loaded up on an M.2 enclosure. We haven't given something away in a long time. So here's what we're going to do. Write into live at asknoahshow.com. Tell me what your battle story is, where this would have saved you, where having every ISO known to man on a drive. One of the guys that works for us, one of our technicians, uh, is uses Ventoy, and he carries a little 128 gig uh, flash drive with him, has it loaded up with ISOs, and uh, it's not even half full. And he has every ISO that he could ever imagine using, and it served him really well. So you tell me what your war story is, where it would have saved you, and we'll pick a winner next week, and we'll give one of those drives away and ship it to you. Our third email comes in 
from Corey. Corey writes back in and says, Hi, Noah. Thanks so much for addressing my topic on the show last week. To follow up with my previous email about uh, my Firefox not working properly with audio, the specs of my machine are as follows. We're both running Firefox 91.0.2. This problem has persisted on previous versions as well. As far as the extensions, we both have the following extensions installed. Ublock Origin, Multi-Account Containers, Facebook Containers, Privacy Badgers, Decentrali decentralize dark reader can't go online without it boy do i agree with that i used to use https everywhere but i've switched uh but i've switched uh to built-in https protection inside of firefox uh, i'm going to play with the flat pack version and disabling some extensions starting with uh, decentralized. It didn't dawn on me to think about maybe some of the extensions messing with the audio. As always, I love your show. It's great. You should keep your new friend Steve as your co-host, by the way. He seems like good people. Corey, I can attest Steve is good people, and Steve will probably be here for for the for the, for the foreseeable future. I, um, I appreciate you writing back in. You don't, to be clear, you don't have to disable all of your extensions to troubleshoot your audio. You can simply restart in, in, in safe mode, and that will allow you to start with all the extensions disabled, and you can just see if that solves your problem. If it does, then you can go down the cherry-picking path of trying to figure out what specifically you need to kill. Our fourth email comes in from Matthew. Matthew writes in and says, Hey, Noah, wanted to comment about the Firefox problem that Corey asked about in episode 247. I don't know if it's the same issue, but when using Firefox Flatpak, I did need to install this Kodak for FlatHub to get videos to play properly. I hope it helps. And then he includes a link to the FlatHub uh, installation of FFmpeg Full. And so we'll have that link for you in the show notes. And Steve, didn't that come up in the chat room as well or inside of our matrix room, maybe after the show? Um, I'm not sure about this specifically, but I was the one that was saying um, I suspected a Kodak issue during the during the show. Okay. So... Um, yeah, because I had I'd experienced something similar. So it seems like another user is on the same track as I am. It's two votes for you, Corey. Two votes for the uh, for the for the FFmpeg thing. I give that a shot. Email five comes in from Jordan. Jordan says, "I have a suggestion for Richard, who is looking for a way to manage his documents. This is great. It's called Paperwork." Paperwork is a desktop Linux application specifically designed to collect all your digital and physical documents in one place. It does OCR for scanned documents. It makes your whole archive searchable. You can add tags, descriptions, documents. All the data is stored in a folder so you can keep it anywhere, including Nextcloud or an encrypted disk. You can check it out here, openpaper.work. So, of course, we'll have a link for you in the show notes. This is absolutely fantastic. I installed this on my laptop so I could play with it a little bit and kind of familiarize myself uh, absolutely fantastic. The only thing is I, as I was kind of stepping through, I was like, okay, how would I use this and how, how would this work? The, one of the things that I came across was that if, if my wife was there, we'd have to basically have a shared machine. So far as I understand it, um, I suppose you could do something with like an NFS share, but it looks like it's primarily designed, uh, to work on a local machine. Now, again, like I say, you could have like a, a free NAS box with an NFS share and you could map that so that each local device is referencing the this, this, this same uh, source directory. But I, I kind of wonder how that would work in, in somewhat of a shared environment, but absolutely a, a, a fits like a glove for the rest of his requirements as long as you paired that with some sort of native disk encryption, which would allow you to, of course, then encrypt the content. Uh, Steve, did you have a chance to take a, take a look at Open Paper? You know what? I tried, but I keep getting a 503 error from where I am, and I didn't bother trying to turn on my VPN to see mm. uh, what was what was happening with that. Didn't have time today, but I really liked this. Uh, I really liked the suggestion, and this is a big part of the reason why I wanted to help out with the emails was because, you know, the more effort that we as a show put into emphasizing user feedback, the more it actually kind of compounds on itself, and we end up having users help out when we don't end up having an answer for it. And it's fantastic. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, the community comes to light. I've, I've said it from day one that the, the audience is always smarter than any one individual person. So I absolutely love that. So thanks, Jordan, for writing in. This is absolutely fantastic and a tool I plan to take a look at and deploy myself. Our pick of the week this week is w -E -Z -W -S -L. So a security, a cybersecurity firm called Red Code Labs has created the first open source tool called 
Easy WSL. And what this does is it essentially converts any Docker image of a Linux distro uh, to boot with the Windows subsystem uh, WSL. So if you're familiar with it, if you're one of those people that work inside of a Windows only environment, you go to your boss, boss, I want to run Linux. Nope, you can't run Linux. Why? Well, we have WSL now. You can run Linux right on your Windows computer there, just like we want you to do. But boss, it doesn't have Arch. It doesn't have Gen 2. It doesn't have insert your distro that you want to use for whatever reason you want to use it. Well, doesn't matter. We're not doing it. Use that, uh, that Ubuntu thing that comes there with WSL. Well, here's your answer. Easy WSL. It offers a wide range of free Linux distros, several of which are not ordinarily available in the Microsoft stores, and distros that aren't available can be easily converted from a Docker image to use with WSL with just a single command. You can learn more at github.com slash redcode-lab slash easy WSL. In the news this week, Libra Elect 10 is out. This is the final version of Libra Elect 10.0.0, and it brings the latest version, Cody, that is Cody version 19.1, codenamed Matrix, to Libra Elect. So, quick refresher, if you're not familiar with what Cody is, we'll start there. It is a home media library application. I absolutely love it. I personally run it on the NVIDIA Shields. Um, a lot of people run it on Raspberry Pis. Up until very recently, it used to run on Apple TV, but I understand, uh, thanks to, to, to a conversation with Steve, that that's no longer a thing. Um, but what Cody does is you essentially, it is the Linux... Uh, open source based interface that you would want to see on your television to access your local media. And so if you're like me, every time you purchase a piece of media, because I still purchase my media, I don't borrow it uh, from, from a monthly fee. Or if I do, I'm very clear with myself and my family and everybody else that, hey, this is on borrowed time. The number of times that a streaming service has pulled a particular piece of content, my kids come out and go, dad, we have this show and it's not there on the TV. Okay. All right. I get it. So what we're going to do, if you like that show, we're going to purchase that show, then we will own it, and then it'll be here until Kingdom Come, because I've never lost a file. I store all my stuff on ZFS. It doesn't go anywhere. Um, and so Kodi is the interface, the software that ties back to my FreeNAS box and allows me to play movies, TV shows, music, uh, plain video files, all of those things. Libra Elect, then, is a distribution specifically built around Kodi. And so what it allows you to do is you install Libra Elect on... Uh, a computer, or in, in this case, a Raspberry Pi is one of the things they're pushing, and it turns it into a Kodi appliance, essentially. Just plug the HDMI cable in, and it works flawlessly. Now, uh, some of the things I really enjoy about Libra Elect specifically, I've started to pair it to the Intiset remotes, which are a universal remote. And the nice thing about that is every remote in my house, which the 422 is what I'm using, we'll have a link for you in the show notes, the 422 Intiset remote is an IR-based remote, and I have the same remote in every room in our house. So no matter what the brand of TV is, the button layout is the same, the, the, the buttons are all the same. So all my kids know, and my wife, all know, hey, here's the center button to select, here's the arrow buttons to move around, here's the hot keys that get you to this thing, that, or the other. And it doesn't matter if it's running on the uh, on, on an NVIDIA Shield, if it's running on a Raspberry Pi, if it's running on the dedicated Kodi device that I have, all of those devices all are paired to the exact same universal remote control. And then because it's a multi-device remote control, it allows me to control the TV by pushing one and control the Kodi box, whatever that happens to be, by pressing two. Again, button layout is all the same. Libre Elect allows me to use a $100 Raspberry Pi setup in place of a three or $400 NVIDIA Shield. Now, does the NVIDIA Shield have some advantages? Yes, it does, because it runs some of those alternative streaming services I was talking about. Does it have some downside? Yes, it does. It constantly streams ads to the point that it was starting to drive you nuts, Steve. Yeah, it really was. Um, I I really like Cody, and um, I actually have a little, a little tangent here, if you'll bear with me. Um, so as you know, we've been moving and I needed another streaming device to keep the kids happy because previously we only had the projector and, you know, we had a media room. So uh, it had always been Cody on there, but now we had a second one. So I was looking for another device. I ended up buying an Apple TV and I put it back in the box after we moved into our house specifically because I couldn't get Cody on it. I had tried a couple of uh, other applications but and I'd even written into some 
very notable applications you can get for the Apple platform saying, hey, I'm looking for, I was specifically looking for either the ability to create a playlist on the fly. So like Cody allows you to hit Q or bring up the menu and just say Q item. And it's a temporary playlist that, you know, you can clear or not. And I was looking for similar type things or the ability to stop play after so many episodes. So for example, we have Plex as well, but Plex will just continuously play until whenever, which means if you fall asleep with the TV on or you walk away or whatever, you end up having your entire library marked, which I actually have done. I've, I've walked away forgetting that it was played and I had just played through the entire library and marked all of them as watched by the time that I got back to it. So yeah, I, I actually parked my Apple TV. It's sitting on the shelf behind me in favor of my uh, NVIDIA Shield, even though the NVIDIA Shield has kind of put ads into the, um, into the equation just because I can put Cody on, on the NVIDIA Shield. Kind of put ads is, uh, that's the understatement of the year. The home screen has a banner that cycles through, hey, would you like to watch this? Hey, this is available on this app. Hey, this is available on that app. Hey, do you not even have this app? I'm going to show you an advertisement for it anyway. Hey, this is a game that's on. Below that is a constant stream. And I'll go through and press and hold on all of those things and remove all of those widgets. And it seems like a few days later, they're all back again. Like, I can't get rid of them. But it's okay. I've kind of gotten into the point where I just I go into Cody and then I just don't leave Cody. And that seems to kind of alleviate the problem. But I've yet to find a device that does all of the things that the NVIDIA Shield does uh, at the performance level that the NVIDIA Shield does them. But as soon as I do... Man, I'm ready to upgrade, especially because, you know, the latest version with the Pro, they don't have support for the IR blaster anymore. And so you have to use an external one plugged in. Anyway, back to Libra. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I st I'm still holding on to the, I want to say the 2019 or the 2017, whatever the, the previous one is that came with the controller and the remote Yep. Uh, with the IR blaster on it. I'm, I'm hanging on to that one for dear life. Yeah, the, uh, it's... Uh, yeah the, here's the thing it the the ir thing is amazing because it allows you to use it with all those universal remotes and uh, and when they pulled that it's kind of frustrating but they're, they're going they're going like gangbusters on ebay if you want one that supports ir you just pay over the moon for them nowadays so it's really frustrating uh anyway so libra elect i have real high hopes that libra elect 10 uh or a future version solves this because it enables us to purchase or and to build dedicated cody appliances and so uh, you need an operating system uh, that can do that. And um, so I'm, I'm, I'm real excited to see where this project ultimately goes. I've had it running a couple of different times. Um, it works well. I think that there are some places for it to be improved. Uh, some of the issues that they have with Libra Elect 10 are no interlacing with hardware video decoders. There's an issue with the 4K 60p output that's uh, supported by the driver, but it has some issues. Uh, for example, it'll give you a no signal when the TV is put into standby and then turn back on. Uh, the 60 frames per second H.264 hardware decoder may need uh, a flag of force underscore turbo equals one. Uh, inside of a config file to avoid AV sync issues and skipping. And the 10 to 12 uh, bit video output isn't implemented yet. And so 10 bit video is displayed as eight bits. Uh, also, there's another issue. Cody runs at 4096 at 2160 instead of the 3840 2160 on 4K TVs that it's supposed to do after it's uh, fresh installation. So, uh, anyway, there are some issues with it. It's not perfect. I will also, uh, uh, well, yeah, it's not perfect, but I will tell you that it is something that you should ultimately consider or at least look at playing with. I also want to give a plug to, uh, Cody.tv, which has all of the, uh, accessories that you need. They have uh, specific cases for the Raspberry Pis and those kinds of things. Um, so I would invite you to check the Cody project out at Cody.tv as well. Kernel 5.14 has been released, and there's a number of very exciting features. The Probably the biggest uh, functional feature is this introduction of secret memory areas, and this is thanks to the memfd underscore secret feature. And this is going to provide enhanced protection against pro cross-process secret user space memory exposures. This will ultimately harden the kernel against 
flaws and exploits that come out. Additionally, this is kind of a fun one. They now have hot unplug features. And so you have the opportunity now to disconnect your AMD Radeon graphics card. You can just rip it out of the computer and it won't cause a kernel panic because it just goes, oh, he unplugged his graphics card. That's cool. And you can plug it back in. So that's exciting. Uh, hardware improvements continue with the ability to select and sh uh, the select and share button on the Microsoft Xbox One controller will now function uh, thanks to the support in this kernel, and they have full mainline support for the Raspberry Pi 400. So if you if your memory serves, this is the little Raspberry Pi that's actually built into a keyboard, and so Dell is actually planning to include hardware-based kill switches. Uh, for the microphone and webcams in its future laptops, and so they've built support into the Linux 5.14 kernel for that. And audio enthusiasts will be rejoicing because there is now a low latency USB audio driver that's included in this release, and the audio driver lowers the latency during audio playback and has been tested to work with Pulse Audio Jack and Pipewire. If you're looking for the latest kernel, you'll likely get kernel 5.14 when Ubuntu 21.10 drops, but of course nothing is in stone. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome to the program the director of IT for New Springs Church, Patrick Emerson. Patrick, welcome to the show. Hi, Noah. How's it going? Excellent, Patrick. So I, I want to start by uh, by kind of talking about how you and I got to know each other. You reached out to Alta Speed Technologies and said, hey, I'm the IT director of a church, got the job, and I'm going to be walking through essentially familiarizing myself and really understanding this network. And when I say a church, we're not talking about, you know, a little 50 pew church. How big is your campus? How many people attend and how large by compare or how large then is your network? Okay. So, uh, the, the campus is, uh, pretty large, uh, you know, network wise, we've got 10 Dell managed switches, and uh, we've got 100 employees, and we uh, see about 5,000 people on the weekend after the pandemic. Before the pandemic, it was around 7,000 people on a weekend. But we also reach 10,000 people online every weekend. So that, that means that you need a network to support the kind of services that you're providing to these people. What does your network – let's go – Pre, before you got involved, before you started poking around and doing stuff, before AltaSpeed got involved, what kind of equipment did you have? What did the network layout look like? Well, actually, when I took over, uh, we were just changing to uh, a Cohesity uh, network attached storage, and we had Sophos uh, for our firewall, an XG330, and... Uh, so, so that's that's the equipment that we started with uh, on, on the on the one side. Uh, we've had a couple Dell switches that uh, run ESXi hosts and uh, does our vit uh, virtual machines. Uh, both of our uh, domain controllers are virtualized, and we've got a few other uh, virtual machines that do some things around the campus. But yeah, when I got here. Uh, when I started, every hard drive was completely full. Every uh, uh, and, and I actually jumped in to help the guy who was the director of IT at that time. Uh, you know, because everything was uh, you know falling over, and, and and so when I come in, it was uh, really with buckets trying to bail water. So you come into this uh, this this environment, a massive networking and IT, and IT needs, and it gets to the point where you say we've got to get we've got to make some progress. Let's start from the let's start from the outside, work our way in. How are you getting your internet connection? What does your connection to the world look like? Uh, so we we've actually got uh, we got Cox Business Internet and Cox Optical Internet coming in, and we've got them. Uh, so that they fail over. So we start off with the uh, Cox Optical Internet, 
uh, is what we want to be running on. But if we have anything go down, uh, we got work switches over directly to the Cox Business Internet, which still has enough bandwidth to uh, keep the live streams going. For those that aren't familiar, tell me a little bit about, well, actually, we'll come back to the Cohesity thing. So you have a, a Cox Internet. It comes in. You have you have the Sophos. Uh, and then what did you have for switches? Uh, we, we've got Dell managed switches. Uh, we've got 10 Dell managed switches that uh, then break out uh, a few unmanaged switches. And, uh, you know, then mainly we're, we run mostly off of Unify access points. We've got 24 Unify access points. And so when you sat down and you started looking at your network requirements, you saw the Sophos, you saw the the Dell Man and switches, what things did you like, what things didn't you like, and what were your goals? What did you set out to accomplish? Well, uh, when I was looking at everything, I knew that we had a nice backbone. They had built everything with fiber uh, between the switches. Uh, but the problem I had was the Sophos was... Uh, hadn't been updated and there was no documentation of any kind to tell me uh, what the firewall rules were and, and how the VLANs were set up and and uh, I realized you know that it was kind of a walled garden that I had to play in their walled garden and, and when I called them they said yes for $300 an hour we'll start working through this with you and I I'm, I'm going to start calling some people I know and see if we can't get, you know, something in here because it was a single point of failure that we had, we had a, uh, we actually had it go off during one of the services for 14 minutes as it rebooted and before we were back online. And so I knew that we needed to get that single point of failure out of here and, and come up with what the solution would be so that we didn't go offline again. Okay, so you're looking and, to get... Uh, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, and so that's why I reached out to you and said, hey, Noah, I, I've got to come up with a solution here. And, you know, I've, I've been listening to you and, and Chris Fisher since uh, the early days. And, uh, you know, I, I, I've heard of PS Sense. I, I knew that there were some open source solutions, uh, especially solutions that, you know, if... if I couldn't have you help me with it. There'd be other people that knew about it, and there's a, a whole community behind it that would help me get the answers that I needed instead of having to pay through paywalls and and to get where we want to go. So, yeah, that's that was where I called you and had you jump in and help me figure out how to go forward. Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, th that's something that we specialize in. We love coming in. And dealing and, 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 and converting people, so to speak, to open source software, helping them understand how open source software can fit their needs. So you set out, you said, hey, I want to keep this redundant dual WAN. That seems good to me. Um, how many VLANs did you have? Uh, we, we currently have four VLANs, but I can see that there's definitely need for a few more. Uh, the segmentation so that we can keep uh, the creative team separate from the production team, separate from the kids' ministries and, and you know, the back of, you know, all the uh, accounting and everything to keep everything separate. Sure. So you have these VLANs. You know that you're going to grow them. The thing that I think uh, initially took me and I said, you know, we need to pump the brakes here a little bit and I want to make sure that we understand our requirements is you move a ton of traffic in your network because you're moving uh, – these video files from your services each week. Yeah, we create 1.4 terabytes a week of video files. And then those have to move from production over to the creative. And uh, that's where they uh, get it all packaged up. And, and uh, we our, uh, our, our weekly sermons are also put out on local news and uh, then repackaged for uh, the Hillsong Network, uh, you know, so it, it goes several places, and, and we're keep growing that. So we've got to keep all of the data files uh, clean so that we can repackage them. If somebody says, 
hey, we love the content, but we only got a 45-minute spot. You've got to shrink that hour service into 45 minutes. They'll re-edit it so that it works in, in another spot so that we can, uh, you know, get it out on the air. So I want you to dig into that a little bit for me. Tell me a little bit about what a typical week at, at New Springs look like. There's probably some people that are listening. They're like, my church, uh, church opens up on Sunday morning and then shuts down, or Saturday, uh, opens up in the morning, runs a church service, and then closes back down. Then we're good for the week, right? Or maybe Wednesday there's some other kids' activities. What does a, what does a, what does a business operation uh, look like for you throughout the week? Well, we're always prepping because when you invite 5,000 people in, you that doesn't stop just because you got a big project going on. So there's a lot of setting up and tearing down. Uh, we're, we're actually going through and remodeling in a lot of areas. So, uh, you know, on a, we, we're off on Sunday afternoon and Monday. So Tuesday's our first day of the week. And that first day of the week, you're trying to attack everything that, you know, that might affect the next weekend. And then as it gets closer to the weekend, you start working on things, you know, getting things prepped to have everybody come in. So uh, you've got people in the creative team that are creating content and, and pamphlets. And, you know, we've, we've got a huge children area where we see about 1,500 kids on a weekend. And uh, those 1,500 kids, you got to have handouts and stuff like that. So we've got a huge printer that, you know, they're always creating content. So there's always stuff going and there's, uh, you know, there's kids' ministries, uh, middle school and high school, and, you know, they're doing live streams of their uh, uh, services on YouTube and everything. So they're all creating new content, and we're building stuff in the background for uh, for the environment. So uh, creating, uh, like, information kiosks and stuff like that. It's a big enough campus that... Uh, we actually have kiosks with push buttons on them that will tell you where you're at so you can find your car. You know, that, well, you can find your way back around to where you come in so you can find your car. If you haven't been here for a few times, it, you know, it's a little confusing. So That was actually one of the first projects you reached out. So dig into that a little bit. Talk about the technical back end of those kiosks and how those work. Oh, yeah, that was fun. I uh, Actually, that was one of my first communications with you was asking you, uh, hey, I got some signage. I'm wondering what, what would work good, and you suggested uh, the uh, Screenly, which has been fantastic. We just use the open source version of Screenly, and uh, I've got they, – they were looking at making these kiosks, information kiosks for people uh, so that when they're walking in and out, they'd have one more shot of what's coming up. And uh, they were going to do it with paper, and I started calculating what it would cost to print everything. And I'm like, guys, I think, uh, you know, within a, a few months, we'd probably quickly pay off a, a couple TVs. So we got two 43-inch TVs uh, with a Raspberry Pi and HDMI splitter. And then they come up to me and they said, hey, Pat, how hard would it be to make a push button on here so that people could actually press the button and see a map? So... Uh, now they have content that they can all change uh, by just going to a, a little web page and pushing the new content out, and those things have worked great. That's fantastic. Uh, we got six different locations around the church that use that, and uh, they've worked so good that they're expanding it now. So they're, they're saying, hey, where else can we put this? So going back to the network for a moment, you decide that the walled garden of Sophos isn't working. You step out, you look at PF Sense. Hey, there's a thriving community around PF Sense. It is a well-established enterprise-grade product that runs massive networks. So it meets our requirements at New Springs Church. And you start looking at it. You look at, I think you looked at the XG7100, but then you actually ended up buying two PF Sense boxes. Tell me about that. Oh, yeah. Well, one of the things I wanted to make sure was that uh, I, I could have uh, have a way to play with it without playing with a unit in production. So I got one for my home and one for the church. I got the uh, the little 1100, the XG 1100 for home, and set it up. And then I, I uh, set the uh, 7100 up for the church. 
And what I love is it's the exact same user interface. I might have less port options, but I can go in and play around at a at home where it doesn't, you know, uh, my kids might get mad at me uh, for a few minutes as I say, oh, one second, let me reload the config. But, you know, that's a lot better than taking us offline uh, while we're trying to get ready for the next week. So the thing I think probably everybody wants to hear about, they want to hear about D-Day. So there was a couple of weeks that we started putting planning together and said, okay, so we had tested a couple of things and we, we looked at some of the things that were unknown and tried some of those in one-off in one-off batches. And eventually the plan we decided on for D-Day was we were going to match all of the IP addresses. So all of the interfaces for all of the VLANs, we were just going to give them the same IP address on PFSense that Sophos had. We were going to match all of the rules that were in Sophos and create similar like rules in PFSense. And the idea was on D-Day, we just unplug the Sophos, the WAN connection to Sophos, and we plug it into the net gate. And if everything goes well, all of the clients will just start sending their traffic to a different appliance and everything would work. And how far do we get, Pat, before things started falling apart? Well, I think uh, there were, uh, you know, we, we, we set everything up on the uh, uh, NetGate. And we were ready to test the, uh, the VLAN functionality, and we unplugged the cable, and the Sophos box freaked out and froze up, <laughs> and we, we fooled around with that for an hour, trying to get the Sophos back up and running, and finally decided, wait. I think today's the day we switch. So we were actually playing in a slow role where we tested and kind of did the slow migration. And uh, basically the two-week slow migration turned into the, hey, what are you doing the rest of the night? <laughs> yeah, it was, it was kind of funny because, you know, like you say, the first hour it was, you know, we unplugged the Sophos to go to NetGate just to make a couple of changes. We couldn't get the Sophos to come back on. So we immediately abandoned the migration process to NetGate and we hadn't changed anything really at the network at that point. And so we focused yeah. on Sophos and how do we get Sophos to come back online? And I think both you and I, uh, about 30 to 45 minutes in went, how long do we really want to to putz around with fixing this device that the whole goal the entire time was to take out to begin with, maybe we just dive all the way in and, and dig into this. And so, uh, you know, about the hour mark, we said, all right, that's just what we're going to do today. We're just, we're going to switch over to NetGate. And uh, yeah. I, I guess, what were some of the problems that we encountered right away, Patrick? Uh, once we, we plugged everything in, again, everything supposedly is configured. What were some of the things that we missed? What were if somebody else was thinking about doing this? What would they need to know? What were some of the problems that came up? Uh, well, it, it's really good if you have someone sitting over your shoulder that can make sure that you write down the IP address correctly. <laughs> <laughs> and that was a problem on my end. As we were uh, as we were trying to get the fiber up and going, uh, you know, if you get the eight and the six out of order, <laughs> that, turns out that matters. A lot of time, a lot of time trying to get everything working, and it won't work. But uh, luckily, the guys from Cox got on online with me later. Uh, they they read everything back to me, and they're like, ah, I don't think you got that quite right. But uh, other than that, we had the we got the uh, we had the cable internet up and going uh, good that night. But then we we were kind of surprised the next morning when I come in and the internet was down, and, and it was because Cox Business Internet was down that day. It just happened to be an outage in the area, so we didn't have failover and we didn't have the. Uh, it didn't have the fiber back up and running before we start, you know, before we were done the first evening. Uh, but it was on within an hour and a half, and they had gotten a hold of me, and we figured out that I I need to learn to write my numbers down better. So uh, uh, we'll come. I want to come back to the uh, the 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 fiber WAN. So the first day, um, I think one of the things that came up was uh, the well, they weren't getting DHCP addresses, and so uh, we had to make sure to enable the DHCP relay because Windows has you're using Windows as a, as a DHCP server. Windows needs to be able to talk to all of the VLAN simultaneously, so that when a client comes on on a particular VLAN. 
it's able to hand that DHCP address out. And so, oh, yeah. and so we, we, I think that was the first thing that we ran into. We're like, why are we getting IP addresses? Oh, cause we have not enabled DHCP relay. So we, we, we set that up and, and set the for the DHCP relay to point to the, the domain controller, which, uh, wouldn't have been a problem if PFSense had been the one handing out the IP address. So it's only when you have an external uh, DHCP server, which in an environment your size is, I think, completely appropriate, um, that's where that's where that issue ran in. If if memory serves, we didn't run into any other VLAN issues other than when we tried to go and lock down the firewall. Um, by that point, we were well into, I think, midnight, one in the morning, and our brains were starting to kind of fog up a little bit. And yeah. so with rules, uh, it's important to remember that at the end of the day, you've got to have an allow rule that says, hey, if you're looking for something I don't know about, go ahead and permit that or that VLAN isn't getting to the Internet. Yeah, uh, that, I learned a lot about, well, and, and I have had a lot of programming experience and a lot of uh experience being good with computers, but as far as the networking side, that was my weak point. And boy, firewall rules, that, that's something definitely, well, and that was kind of what we were slow rolling was we were going to test and then draw back, go back to the Sophos and run the weekend and come back and do one more week test, you know, just slow roll it if we could. But, you know, when, the Sophos decides it's giving up the ghost, uh, and you got a perfectly good firewall sitting right on top of it. Uh, I think we did a great job of jumping in there, just knocking down the problems one one at a time. You know, and the thing is, the one of the things I consistently give praise to NetGate and PFSense for, and I will include OpenSense in this as well, um, their user interface is so intuitive that even if you've never worked with firewall rules before, Patrick, what I'll just ask, what did you think about it? How how did it, how did it feel it, learning on that device? Oh, it was so easy to see the flow and how, you know, how you knew what you were blocking or knew what you were allowing. It is really easy to see that. And uh, you know, if you have any programming experience at all, you you can kind of read it almost like if statements, you know, that, you know, on this, you got any, any, you're going to let that data flow. So you're picking, uh, you know, you're, you're picking uh, exactly what uh, your source is and your port and destination and, and the granular control. And, you know, I've dug in a little bit to some of the advanced features. And, boy, it uh, doesn't take long to get way past my use cases. Yeah, it's really fantastic, and that, it always gives you a place to grow from. So speaking of growing, Patrick, what does the future network plan look like for expansion? What do you, how, has, how has your experience been so far uh, with NetGate and with the network migration, and what do you plan to add, or what, where do you plan to go from here? Well, uh, we're, we're doing some testing. Uh, we're, I've actually got some approval today to go ahead and, uh, plan on adding 10 gigabit to the video editor's workstation so that uh, we can go ahead and get those guys uh, working right off the server. Uh, but then we had another issue with the Cohesity. The, uh, the server that they had bought, it, uh, it would be great if we were a transactional. If we were a large bank, this would have been exactly... You know, uh, this would have been a really good fit. So now we're actually looking at uh, building a true NAS box to replace the uh, Cohesity box for video editing and uh, building a, a high-speed network for the creative team so that as those files come in, as that 1.4 terabytes a week comes in, they don't have to move it to local drives, edit it, then move it back. We're going to save them. Tons of time. I actually just got done with a meeting this afternoon with them, and they actually applauded when I presented the plan. 
That's fantastic. Open source, getting applause. That's fa- so. L- uh, let's dig into that a little bit. So your storage needs started with uh, Cohesity is a is a, is a storage solutions provider. But it's it if you think the site the uh, Sophos is a walled garden, this is even more so a walled garden. You get access to the interface, and that's about it. When I asked you how much RAM is in this server, and it was not in an expensive server, you said, yeah, they don't tell me stuff like that. It's just the box that stores stuff. That's all we get to know. We know how much storage we have. Yeah. I can tell you that. Um, and then when you tell me, told me what the renewal price was for the blue sky, as you put it, you're not even, it's, it's not even so much that you're purchasing anything, you're just getting permission to continue to use in a supported environment a storage machine. After I picked myself off of the floor, I went, man, we could build a real nice free NAS box with that much money. Yeah, and that got me dreaming and looking at 45 drives and, uh, you know, seeing what it would take to actually put that together, uh, you know, and I'm like, wow, just for that renewal cost, we, we could have a real contender here, you know, sitting on the network, and everybody started asking all the questions because they've heard, you know, hey, we'll buy this one thing and it'll take care of all the problems, but what's been really cool is watching, watching the open source software actually win the day for us here at Newspring. That's fantastic. So, so we, we, we put together, I think, three different potential solutions for you. One was based on Dell, and Dell has a particular server platform where they a lot of Dell servers will still ship with hardware RAID cards, which is, of course, problematic when you're looking at something like FreeNAS because FreeNAS needs, ZFS needs direct access to the disks. So they do have one server line that allows direct access to the disk, and I think that was the first server that we sold you guys that you're running FreeNAS yeah. on, that's working as a backup. So for this new one that's going to replace the primary store, and, and I think you actually bought a second one of those that were, uh, I think you're putting in a data center? Some sort of offsite yeah, backup? That's, that, that's the plan is to have uh, in a data center in Kansas City so we get a little, uh, you know, geodiversity on our backups. We're, we're going to take the 10 terabytes of the most uh, important data uh, and, and move that up to Kansas City and also have it in another place on site so that I got three copies of the data. If we have a bad day, I just want to be able to say, hey, don't worry, I've got all the, I've got our data where we need it. It's been fun enough working with you with that when that server comes in, it might make you drive to Grand Forks to come pick it up so I can see you in person. Uh, oh, I'm ready. I, I, I'm planning that already as uh, saying, well, I, I just got to go pick this one up. So. <laughs> I can't wait. So we, we, we spec'd out three options for you. One was another Dell system. The second one is obviously from IX Systems, which is a place you could purchase one if you needed all the certification stuff that comes with that. And the third is from the company that I think you're leaning towards, which is 45 Drives. And this is a company that builds custom storage servers at scale, and they ship with FreeNAS if you'd like them to. And so they'll build it for you, set it up with FreeNAS, and just ship it, and you can just plug this thing in, and, it, and it's good to go. And so uh, it'll be interesting to see, Patrick, how your where your journey takes you and where God takes your church with this and your technology. But it's been a- an absolute pleasure working with you guys. What advice would you have for somebody else that finds themselves in your position? Well, I tell you, I've been able to have a lot of wise people come around me and uh, spend time and listen to the people uh, we had people at our church that we'd see every week, but I didn't know that they were in charge of the data center for Spirit Aerosystems, you know, and just retired. And, you know, so I've, I've had a lot of really wise people come along beside me and just take the time to think about all the options that are out there. And even if your budget will allow, uh, there's a lot of times that you're getting so much more meat on the bones when you get – something like this, the true NAS box, uh, that, you know, it has a lot of functionality and the fact that I own it from top to bottom and can replace the hard drive. If I'm on the Cohesity box that I asked, I said, if one of the drives go bad, what happens? Well, there'll be a box showing up a few days later with a drive in it and we'll tell you what to do. I want to have more control than that. So, you know, find. Find smart people around you and keep your options open and and look for the best fit for your environment, not just the thing they're trying to sell you. Uh, and 
I, I tell you, if you got a chance to look at open source and see if there's a way to work that into what you're doing, you'll probably end up finding the best of both worlds, exactly what you need and at a price that you can afford. Patrick Emerson, he is the director of IT for New Springs Church in Wichita, Kansas, newsprings.org. If you're in the Wichita, Kansas area, make sure to check them out. Patrick, thanks so much for taking the time to come on the Ask No Show. And, of course, a huge thanks for working with us at Ultra Speed Technologies. And you have an open invitation to come back anytime. Thanks so much. Appreciate it, Noah. Steve, any questions for Patrick before we let him go? I just think that the whole thing is is quite mind-boggling. Like, I worked for IMAX, and we pushed a lot of data around uh, for, obviously, huge movie files and stuff like that. So for a church to be doing that that much data every week, just uh, hats off to you to be able to keep everything and uh, going and, you know, the lights on. I think that's fantastic. Yeah. It's, thanks so much. Yeah, it's been a real, real pleasure getting to learn quick and figure it out too you know i i love these technical challenges so that's uh, that's been awesome getting the opportunity well, we appreciate having you uh again thanks for joining us uh we're just about out of time i will tell you that a couple of things if you'd like to keep a tabs on what's going on here at the ask noah show we invite you to follow us on twitter at ask noah show you can follow me on twitter at colonel linux steve are you on twitter I am. I don't post very often, but I'm at Linux Ovens. At Linux Ovens. You can follow Steve. Hey, the show notes, which contain everything we do on the show, all the articles and references that we use on the show, you can find those at podcast.asknoahshow.com. Make sure to check out the site, asknoahshow.com, for all the show resources. We'll be back next Tuesday at 6 p.m. Central, asknoahshow.com. Have a good week.